sunny today in a high of 21. Right now it is 11 degrees. Uh, we're just about one hour away from win a baby. And it's all going to come down to the five couples being in our uh, studio. Actually, in our front lobby because the studio is not big enough for all these people. It's early morning, Ottawa. Five couples line up. They've been selected for a contest. But it's not for a car, a vacation, or millions of dollars. For these couples, it's the ultimate prize. Uh, I just wanted to talk to one or two of the couples before we go on the air just to see what the emotion is right now. Does anybody want to say a few words? All right. How long have you guys been trying? Five, six, seven years. <laughs> and how are you guys feeling? Uh, very emotional. They're hoping to win a baby. Every couple here is looking at me like, Mahler, shut the hell up and read the names. All right, here we go. The winner for win a baby, the winner is all of you. You're all getting up to three fertility treatments. Congratulations. <laughs> and to describe the scene right now, there's not a uh, dry eye in the house. I can't even do it justice right now with what's going on here. The Ottawa radio station contest made international headlines. It was controversial and popular. Hundreds of contestants applied. 15% of Canadian couples have problems conceiving, and this is the face of the struggle. For many, infertility treatment is their only option, and the costs can be prohibitive. Does anybody want to say a few words? Let's go to couple B here for a sec. How are you feeling? I'm feeling like you guys gave us an opportunity to show the world that infertility does not discriminate and that we are all young and that this has affected all of our lives in the most profound way. Since our second failed IVF, I feel like I have been robbed of any optimism I had left. Will it ever work? Amber Wildig would have loved the chance to win a baby. When I try to imagine what it would be like to have a belly, to get past the three-month mark in pregnancy, I can't. I used to be able to, but these days when I try to picture it, I just see more money being wasted and more tears being shed. She spent four hours filling out the application to realize the contest was open to Ottawa area residents only. She and her husband, Chris, are desperate to have a baby. This is our hope chest. When we were pregnant, we picked up a few things. And if we ever do decorate this room, we want to do owls. I have a thing for owls. I don't know why. How do you feel when you pull these things out of your hope chest? Ah. Uh, what are you thinking? It's hard. It's hard. Um, I hope that we get to use them one day. Um, you say it's a hope chest, but it doesn't really give us hope. It kind of, it's a, a reminder of what we don't have. Yeah, I don't really come in this room. It's, it's our empty room in the house. We were very naive about it in the beginning. We're going to go on our honeymoon and come back pregnant. <laughs> Within a year, Amber and Chris did get pregnant and then miscarried right before Christmas. Though losses like that are common, Amber felt that something just wasn't right. So she asked their doctor what they should do. He basically just said, you guys are young and It'll take time. But later, tests showed Chris had a problem with his sperm, and Amber had a problem with her eggs. I was 24 when I was diagnosed with, uh, with diminished ovarian reserve and being told that I had the eggs of a 37-year-old. Um, it's painful. Their only hope was IVF. Financially, it's pretty much the hardest thing next to emotionally. How much have you spent on trying to have a baby? We've spent $24,000 to date. They've been lucky to have help from their family, but they don't know how much more they can spend or how much more they can take. You start with, a, with an ocean of hope and then with every failed attempt, by the end of it, you're really, you're carrying that hope, you know, in, in a vial, <laughs> in your purse. I think sometimes patients overestimate their chance of, of pregnancy. You will have patients say, well, yes, I'm 40, but I'm a young 40, I'm healthy. Or they, they mention the fact that they've heard of celebrities who've had pregnancies after 40. What are their financial limits with treatment? Uh, what are their emotional limits? 
what are their physical limits. So you're trying to give patients back some control in a, in a situation that, in which they don't have a lot of control. Once a couple decides to go ahead with IVF, choosing a clinic can be tricky. One of the selling factors can be the clinic's success rates. It's just not something you can pick up off the street. It, you, it, you have to almost be inside an IVF clinic to understand the ins and outs of success rates. Almost all of Canada's fertility clinics have websites, most of which post their success rates or pregnancy rates. But they all keep numbers in different ways, and those numbers can be confusing and even misleading. So the pregnancy rate per cycle started gives you the lowest pregnancy rate because it includes everyone. The pregnancy rate per embryo transfer is always the highest percentage because it includes only the women who negotiated their way successfully through an IVF cycle and had an embryo transfer. Success rates are the single most important figure for fertility clinics, but it can be hard to know if they're accurate. The only organization keeping track of fertility statistics is the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society. It's owned by the fertility clinics themselves. Clinics submit their numbers on a voluntary basis, and there is no outside system to audit those stats. No one is checking the numbers. You don't know if they're reporting all the cases. You don't know how accurately they're reporting the cases. So you have to be, uh, you have to take it with a grain of salt and the buyer should beware. And to add to the confusion, clinic success stats are published, but not on a clinic by clinic basis. According to the websites, there's currently eight number one clinics in Canada. I don't know what the success rate of the clinic down the street is. I only know my own. Now when I choose to post a, uh, my own data, I'm, I'm posting the data that I wish to post. That's how it is in Canada. But other countries, including the United Kingdom and the United States, do have regulations, and their systems have built-in auditing. But keeping track of numbers can come with a cost, distorting patient care in order to keep the numbers up. In other words, choosing patients most likely to get pregnant quickly. It would be easy for any clinic to increase their pregnancy rate overnight. And every clinic knows this. All they have to do is transfer more embryos. Are they encouraging you to do IVF because that's really what you should do? Or they just want to bolster their numbers? Or are they discouraging you from IVF for your sake? Or are they doing it because they don't want you to harm their numbers? Would-be parents shouldn't choose a fertility clinic based solely on success rates. Statistics are like lampposts, you know, that they, they're good to lean on, but they don't always shed a lot of light. They can be selective. Some might argue that's manipulative. Possibly. Possibly. But some wonder if our manipulation of reproductive technology has other implications. Some people would argue if a couple is infertile, you know, that tells you something in and of itself, and perhaps they are not meant to have children because they are not meant to pass on their genes. We're allowing fertilization to happen when nature would never have allowed it. I think that's true. I do believe that's true. And we don't know the consequences. I, we don't know the consequences. Next on 16 by 9, science is making babies, but at what price? The higher the technology that's needed to actually conceive the pregnancy, the more likely that you are to have some problems afterwards. 